Okay, welcome to Ashby Village. Um, I'm here to just make an introduction of Joan Cole, but before I start, I want to do a few introductions in terms of things that we need to do, sort of housekeeping. And okay, so first of all, primary. The bathrooms are back there. I think you go through that door and you'll see the two bathrooms. So if you need to go, there you go. Uh, <laughs> anyway, I'm also asked to be sure that if any of you who are sitting in front don't wish to be uh, taped or videoed, that if you want to, if this is the best time to move to the back of the room. Anybody want to do that? Otherwise, you're going to be videoed, particularly if you're in the front, okay? So I want to thank the members of the Arts and Culture Committee, particularly for putting this together this afternoon. So I'm going to run through the names. Betty Webster, Betty's out there somewhere. Raise your hand. Uh, Marsha Friedman, uh, Sigrin, where are we? Right there. Uh, and Rochelle, who's not here today, um, she's out of town, so she wasn't able to attend. And finally, Christina Holland, who's back there at the table. So um, the next thing is, if there's, we're going to have volunteers on the side. If you did fill out a card and you want to ask a question, we're going to have a volunteer standing on each side with pen and card, and you can fill it out then. But if you have a card now and you want to turn it in, we can take them now. Joan will be pulling them all together at the end. Uh, the last thing I want to mention is that uh, the books will be back there, so if you want, Terry will be signing books at the end. And then finally, but not least, I wanted to introduce Joan Cole, who really has an amazing career. And I, I'm just going to highlight just a couple of things. Joan starts out with having been a clinical psychologist in the Berkeley area for over 40 years. And sadly, she's retiring, although I don't know if she's sad about that. But uh, anyway, she's had an incredible career. She started out with Ashby Village Show. She was one of the early members of Ashby Village. And she's been, she's a liaison to the board of directors. And she's been on a number of committees. So she is going to be introducing Terry this afternoon, OK? I have to put this on. You want to put it on? You got it. I got it. Can you hear me? No. no. Okay, we're going to speak into the mic. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for coming. This is wonderful. I am so delighted and privileged to introduce my dear friend and colleague, whom I met in the 70s when we worked together in Psychotherapists for Social Responsibility. I mentioned, can't hear me? Okay, how's that? Okay? All the way back there? All right, great. I mentioned this because at that time, I had the privilege of bearing witness to his work as a social and political activist as well as as a brilliant clinician. Terry is always, always attendant to the intersections of the psychological and social fabric and the context in which people live their lives. And it's not every psychiatrist who does that. So it's special and you're special. Before I tell you a few details about Terry's remarkable work in this field, I want to add a few personal notes. Terry has long attended to the problems of social injustice and has stimulated hundreds of students with his radical analysis of society and the structural foundations of inequality. He's helped students and the public to think critically about our own participation in the system and has done so with gentleness, joined with conviction and passion about what he believes. And at a personal level, he is an invaluable colleague and friend. There has never been a time when I couldn't count on him for companionship and deep conversation about either the personal, professional, or the political. 
You're always there, Terry. And I know that there are many people in this life, in his life, who would provide similar testimony to his generous and loving nature. I believe it's these qualities which serve as the foundation for his passion as he meets face to face with prisoners, giving them hope and providing them with a positive experience of someone on the outside who truly cares about the physical and emotional conditions of their lives. While Terry offers a sense of safety, deep empathy and compassion, he also tells the truth as he sees it. Never sugarcoating with false optimism or promise. I know of no more authentic way to build trust. Terry is a graduate of Stanford University, UCLA School of Medicine, and he holds a master's degree in social psychiatry from UCLA. He also, this always interests me, he also did a two-year residency at Tavistock Clinic in London and was a fellow in social and community psychiatry at the UCLA Neuropsychiatric Institute. He's Professor Emer Emeritus at the Wright Institute and a distinguished fellow of the American Psychiatric Association. Now, more to the point. He provides expert testimony for the ACLU, the Center for Constitutional Law, and the SPLC in class action litigation regarding the psychological effects of prison conditions, including isolated confinement and supermax security units, the abysmal quality of correctional mental care, health care, the effects of sexual abuse in correctional settings. By my latest count, he's provided expert witness testimony in more than 30 cases. In preparation for those cases, he's toured Supermax facility in 20 states. You've really gotten around, Terry. He also works with prison legal offices and agencies throughout the country. He's been involved in several landmark cases and is the author of countless articles in seven books, the latest of which is, sitting back there, Solitary, the inside story of supermax isolation and how we can abolish it. Today, he will weave the foundations of that book into his discussion of why it is essential that we understand what goes on behind those walls. We'll hear firsthand accounts of the cruel and psychologically violent prison conditions and how this can and must be changed through a sharp shift in prison culture from that of fear, hatred, deep racism, and cruelty to a culture of rehabilitation, respect, and preparing inmates for life on the outside. Not an easy shift, but a necessary one. Terry will tell us both how and why this can and must be accomplished. He'll talk for about an hour, following which we'll have a discussion with the audience. So fill out those cards that you got, and somebody will bring them to me. And Terry, it's all yours. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> I walked off with it. Thank you, Joan, for that wonderful introduction. And all of the things Joan said about me are true of her in terms of combining the social and the uh, psychological and always looking for the social level when we're doing psychotherapy and other clinical work. Um, and being a, a dear and wonderful friend who I can talk to at all times. Can you hear me all right? The mics aren't working. They just bring it How about now? Yes. Does that work? You have my notes. <laughs> um, as Joan said, I, I have the um, very high honor and privilege of serving as an expert witness. Prisoners are the most voiceless members of our society. 
And the first point I want to make is they are members of our society. They are not in prison somewhere else. They're in prison here in our country. And we're doing things to them. For instance, um, abusive practices in the prison, which I'm going to talk about. Um, it's in our name. Our tax money goes to paying the guards who are abusing the prisoners, including sexual abuse of women prisoners and all kinds of awful things. Part of the privilege of being an expert witness means that I can go in and see things that not everybody can see because the prisons are very uh, secret places. So that's why I like to talk in public and that's why I wrote the book, is to share what it is I see. I serve as an expert in various class action lawsuits, actually a lot more than 30. The 30 is large class action lawsuits, for instance, where all the prisoners of California are the plaintiff and I've been in about three or four of those, uh, and then in many other states. And what I do is I look at the psychological effect of conditions. It used to be crowding, and how crowding uh, makes life in prison miserable. Uh, then I'll talk about how the states and the federal government turned to solitary confinement. And I became an expert. I didn't know anything about solitary confinement, but I started studying the subject because we were putting so many people in solitary confinement uh, and it was causing immense damage and I wanted to find out why. And in fact, there is a research literature. The other main area where I testify is about sexual abuse. Uh, in men's prisons, it's often prisoner on prisoner. In women's prisons, it's most often staff sexually abusing the women, including rape. And I testify in lawsuits about that. When I tour, the, I, I, I make tours of prisons, they have to let me in. Mostly prisons are uh, secretive, they won't let anybody in to look, they, there's a law in California, the press cannot go into the prisons. But if a lawsuit has been certified in a court as a class action, they're required to let the experts for both sides go into the prisons and see anything they want to see. In the course of doing that, besides the tours, I talk to hundreds, even thousands of prisoners. And I've formed some opinions about them as a population. First opinion is, they're very ordinary people. They're about like us out here. There are some thugs among them. They're a very small minority. There are some thugs among us out here. Some of them are running the government. Uh, <laughs> there are very bright people in prison. There are very stupid people in prison like out here. They're really, it's, it's the feeling of, if not, if, if not for fortune, I could be there. The average prisoner is someone who grew up very poor, was traumatized many times in various ways, took to substance abuse, got arrested for a minor crime, which sent them to prison, usually related to the substance abuse, and then eventually got a lot of time to serve in prison, and they're sitting there absolutely wasted lives. I meet them in their 35 years or 40. They're mostly autodidacts. They've taught themselves. They've read everything they can get a hold of. The bright ones can talk with me just like a graduate student. I mean, they know philosophy. They, they're very interesting to talk to. They're just very ordinary people. And they're sitting there saying, I was a stupid kid and I ruined my life when I was 14 or 17 or whatever it was. Um, I'll mention one guy, Miles, and that's because he's an exception to what I'm mainly going to tell you. Miles is a 35-year-old black man who I met. I met when he was 35. He's been in prison since he was 17. Um, one of the things I do is report to the court the awful psychological damage from solitary confinement. Miles had been in solitary confinement in a supermax prison, which means a prison like Pelican Bay State Prison in California that um, specializes in solitary confinement. All the cells are for solitary confinement. And he'd been in that kind of place for many years. One of the things I find very common reported by people in solitary is that they can't concentrate and their memory is impaired. If I was alone in a cell and had to be there for years, I would read and write. That would be one of the only things I could do that would provide human activity and contact. 
the prisoners tell me I can't read. I've stopped reading because I can't remember what I read three pages before. Miles knew that, and he told me the same thing, that that's what solitary does to him. But he figured out a way to work it out. He figured out a reference system so that as he reads, he reads the page he's on, and he keeps going back three pages and then reading forward again, takes notes, and he recognizes that he's got a memory problem and that he can't concentrate. So he works out ways to trick himself into concentrating. In other words, he's very bright, he's very resilient, and I've used him to present one of the harmful effects of solitary confinement, which is a lack of concentration and memory, which of course drives people crazy. I mean, if we couldn't concentrate on anything and we weren't able to be productive, we probably, a lot of us would go crazy or we'd be in great distress. So there are ordinary people, many of whom are very resilient, very courageous, very intelligent, they've taught themselves. They're people who have had massive traumas. When uh, I do a certain number of death penalty appeals, that is people who have been sentenced to death have automatic appeals and part of it is a psychological or psychiatric evaluation. And like all uh, forensic psychiatrists and psychologists, I do a certain number of those. I have never seen the extreme and the uh, large number of traumas in an individual's life. I'm talking about men who were sexually abused as a three-year-old, beaten all of them through their childhood, and saw, saw drive-bys in the street when they were teenagers. They just have a list of traumas that's a mile long, and you start getting a sense, why am I talking to these people on death row, and I'm hearing about all these awful traumas that are pretty foreign to my life, and why are they concentrated on death row? There must be some relationship between trauma and what got them in death row. Tanya is one such person, a black woman in New York. I, test, I met her while I was preparing to testify in a trial in New York, a class action lawsuit. Um, she had been in solitary confinement. They do supermax solitary confinement for women. California does it, New York does it, a lot of states do it. She had been in prison for several years and was expecting to be released to the community three or four months after our interview. As a girl, she had been locked in a dark closet for extended periods as punishment for the smallest transgression by an abusive mother. She suffered flashbacks. This was before she came to prison. She suffered flashbacks, panic attacks, strong startle reaction, and other symptoms which we usually associate with post-traumatic stress disorder. And this is besides being in prison. Because of rule violations in prison, she had been consigned to SHU. SHU is the acronym from California Security Housing Unit. It's used nationally for either cell blocks or entire prisons that specialize in solitary confinement. They're called supermax prisons, and the acronym for that is SHU. So all, of, all of states use SHU. Um, she had uh, just returned to general population after being in SHU for years. The SHU had what she called an extreme effect on her, and she described how she, quote, flipped out, unquote. She felt closed in and felt she suffered from the harsh way uh, SHU inflicts emotional pain. She associated being in SHU with being in the closet as a girl and had many reliving experiences while in the shoe. In other words, she would get confused about whether she was in the closet or whether she was in a jail cell. The sense that she was being locked in a closet again. Her mother would beat her before locking her in the closet. And the two occasions when officers did a takedown, that is, she was not following orders or they were unhappy with something, so they physically grabbed her and threw her to the floor, which is a very common event, particularly in shoes. She felt she was reliving the experience of being locked, beaten and locked in the closet as a girl. In shoes, she cried a lot and was overwhelmed by very painful memories. She described wanting to tell staff about the closet, but as in many shoes, the staff did not really engage prisoners in conversation. In Shu, Tanya experienced flashbacks to abuse by her mother, had nightmares, and had phobias about rats and dogs biting her, which had literally happened while she was in the closet as a girl. 
She told me that officers used searches to harass prisoners and that they did it more to her because they knew she would just lose it. She was hoping she would be able to stay out of trouble for the short time left in her prison term so she could leave without doing more time in shoe. Shoe cells in general, they're, they're the same all around the country. I get asked a lot, oh, how are the <laughs> shoes in Connecticut or New York or Mississippi? They're, they're worse in Mississippi. But generally, a small room, often without a window, often without any ability to see out of the room because and it's a cell because there's a solid metal door. It's the same all over the country and the effects are the same. Some are worse. Some do not, for instance, have functional plumbing. You know, they have a sink toilet um, appliance in the, in the cell. Uh, some do not have mattresses. You sleep on concrete, on a, a concrete slab made to hold a mattress, but they don't give you a mattress as part of the punishment. So the Awful things they do differ from one place to another. But basically, it's being in a small cell. In California, it's often six by eight. In other states, it can be eight by 10 or eight by 12. But that's where you spend 24 hours a day. There's a requirement that you be released. The doors open and closed by remote control. You eat in your cell. They slip you a tray through a slot in the door. And there's a requirement in most states in the federal system that for five hours a week, which means an hour, five days a week, you get to go to the yard. Well, first of all, when I go around and check the log for the yard, I find out that most people in SHU hardly ever go to the yard, that for one reason or another. And one of the reasons is that they get strip searched on the way to the yard. And while they're at the yard, the officers are going to come and what they call a search of their cell, which really means they're going to tear it up, tear up pictures and do all kinds of awful things. So the prisoners say, I'm, I do push-ups in my cell, I'm not going to wreck. Now the other thing is that recreation is usually what they call a dog run. That is that they, the state wants to separate the prisoners so they don't have a yard, they have cages, they have little individual cubicles somewhere where, where people exercise. Um, now, I've just described the average shoe cell. It gets worse. There are practices by policy, and I'm going to describe one, and I think you've probably seen it because it's made it into the movies and into the news a little, and that's called a cell extraction. The very name is abhorrent. In psychiatric hospitals, we do takedowns. And that is when someone is being, a patient is being rowdy and they're out of control, we surround them. And the idea is you surround them with enough people that nobody, including the patient, is gonna get hurt. And you basically go and hug them. And you, know, you <laughs> say, you just can't do that anymore. There's six of us here, we're not gonna let you do that. In shoes, there's no human contact. And if the officers are mad at somebody, for instance, prisoners will often refuse to return their food tray. Behavior on the part of prisoners becomes more and more extreme, the more limited their possibilities for acting are. So one of the things they do is their food might be rotten or have bugs in it or something. And they'll say, I'm not returning my food tray. What they want is for someone to come talk to them about the horrendous food. But what the officer says, okay, and they go and they assemble an extraction team. This is going to be five or six officers in riot gear, padding all over their body, I call them hockey outfits, and a helmet and a gas mask. And they're going to come and spray the person through the food port. They're going to stick a canister of pepper spray and spray them once or several times. And then they're going to open the door and the five or six officers with gas masks are going to rush in, slam them to the far wall, and each one is assigned to grab one limb. Well, as you can imagine, people get beat up. That cell extraction is described in policy. It's, it's by policy, and um, a warden who's a good cop who's gonna follow policy, and I complain about cell extractions being violent, he's gonna say, well, that's the policy. Now, they also do things that aren't in the policy. Beatings, constantly. I've already mentioned sexual abuse, which is pretty prevalent. Um, in Mississippi, I just testified in a big uh, class action lawsuit, their prisons have certain uh, worse uh, 
conditions than what I've described. For instance, the toilets don't work. <clears throat> and when one prisoner in one cell flushes their toilet, it backs up into the toilet in the neighboring cells. Um, the light in, in California, our state-of-the-art shoes, they have very high-tech lights, and the lights are on all day long. In Mississippi, they have a bulb, a naked bulb in the ceiling, and it, there's no switch. So if you want to turn it off, you have to unscrew the bulb. And if you unscrew the bulb a few times, it stops working. It just, you know, you break the bulb. And then they don't replace the bowl. So when I toured this uh, shoe in, in Mississippi, um, I found quite a few prisoners who were in the dark in the middle of the day. And I said, can you turn your light on so I can talk to you? And they said, no, I haven't had any light for two months. And so nobody replaces the bowl. <laughs> the um, hygiene is absolutely horrid. They don't give them uh, things to clean their cells with. Um, well. While I was testifying in a lawsuit in Mississippi about these conditions, on one of my tours, the prisoners all told me about one particular officer on the swing shift who would go around and everybody he was mad at, he would just stick his canister of pepper spray through their food port and spray them and keep on walking. Well, that's against policy. The policy requires when you use pepper spray, you write an incident report, you write a ticket, a disciplinary ticket, and you take the person to the nursing station for decontamination. This guy did none of that. So that's an example of an abuse that's not uh, per policy. I'm going to read part of my testimony about Willie Russell, who was a guy, a black man. He was in his early 30s when I met him, but he'd been in prison since about 20. Uh, he was on death row, which was inside a Supermax shoe in, uh, at Parchman in Mississippi, the state penitentiary. Um, and we were suing because the conditions he was living in were so awful that they violated the constitutional ban on cruel and unusual punishment, the Eighth Amendment. Willie Russell describes his experience being housed in cell 225 for two years, one of four punishment cells on death row. It has, it's a usual shoe cell with all the non-functional toilets and they had mosquitoes and all kinds of problems. But then it has a Lexan shield over the door, uh, which is just further punishment. And when you walk into a cell with a Lexan shield over it, the heat rises immediately. You feel like you're suffocating, you can't breathe. Um, In the summer heat at Parchment, this one aspect of the punishment cell would make them entirely unacceptable by any standard of human decency or of health and mental health minimum standards. But in addition to this cruel and entirely excessive and punitive measure that clearly serves no legitimate penological objective, that's how they talk about it in court, Mr. Russell reports that his cell is always filthy the rain pours in through the walls into his bed. Uh, the toilet floods the cell with backflow from other prisoners' toilets. There are bugs everywhere. The cell is filled with mosquitoes at night. He cannot sleep at night because the lights are on 24 hours per day. He is not permitted to have a fan. He is not permitted television or radio, and there are no activities. And he is even more isolated than the other prisoners on death row. Um, for two years, he was permitted no mattress. There's an elevated uh, concrete slab where the mattress is supposed to be placed. They just took the mattress. And they left him with one blanket, and I think he had a pillow. So he was sleeping on concrete in a cell where he couldn't control the lights, and he had nothing to do, and all the conditions I described were there. One of the things that happens in prison is that there are secret places. In, in California, we have a law banning the press from going into the prisons without the express permission of the Department of Corrections. Um, and visiting is extremely problematic. I don't know if people here have visited a prisoner, but to get into prison is an ordeal. They put you through all kinds of paperwork, then they search you, they, they, they humiliate you, they tell you your clothes aren't appropriate. They make visiting very difficult, besides the fact that these prisons, Pelican Bay, do, Megan, do you want to say something? Oh, I'm saying five hours away I go. Five hours to get there to, or five to hours there. to get in? And then I go through that. Huh. Yeah. Um, <laughs> 
Pelican Bay is at the border with Oregon. So from the Bay Area, it's eight hours. However, most of the prisoners at Pelican Bay come from East LA and San Diego. So for their families to get there is practically impossible. And what's the purpose of that? It keeps it secret. And one of the things that I've found throughout my career, a consistent theme is that people who abuse other people in prison or elsewhere want it to be secret. The way we know what's going on in prisons is that families come out and tell us, and they tell their lawmakers. So the prison system makes it very difficult for them to get in. And the other side of that is that visiting, quality visitation throughout a prison term is correlated with much reduced recidivism rates. As it's intuitive. I mean, if you keep in contact with your loved ones, you do be uh, better. I have uh, noticed a compelling dynamic. People who go in and see this, first of all, are horrified. I go, a lot of times, I will be doing a lawsuit with a big law firm. And the law firm will send associates to tour the prisons with me. They're going to bring a litigator to court. A senior partner is going to be my lawyer in court. But to do the investigation, they're sending associates. These are people who just got out of law school. And they come with me to the prison, and they're just horrified. They're shocked. I think one of the things they're shocked about is that we live in a democracy. We think we treat people right. There's even a belief among us that if you have a serious mental illness, prison would be a good place to be because you get treatment there at least. That's a widespread belief. It's false. Um, so the actual seeing of the reality of prisons is shocking. And one of the ways it shocks all of us, I remember the first time I went in and it shocked me, is where are we living here? I thought we lived in a democracy. I thought we had a humane system and we took care of people who were disadvantaged among us. What is this that's going on here? And for me, as a psychiatrist, and the first time I went was in training, um, it was people with serious mental illness, worst mental illness that I'd ever seen in a state hospital. They were the worst cases I'd ever seen. Then I think what happens is we start thinking, you know, I can't just leave this here. I, I, this is it's just giving me nightmares. I can't get it out of my mind. I have to do something about it. And there is a group of very committed prison activists, prison reformers, who are trying to make changes in this system. So the dynamic is you go in, you see the horrible things on, that I've told you just to surface uh, of in so far. And uh, then you're shocked, and you feel that you need to do something about it. For me, that was LA County Jail. When I was in training, I was asked, the reason I was asked is because I'd been in the LA County Jail. I was the doctor for the Black Panthers in LA. I ran a free clinic, the Bunchy Carter Free Clinic. And the Panthers, among all my other patients, were patients at the clinic. And they got shot up and arrested uh, the same time uh, Freddie Hampton was killed in Chicago. The LA Panthers were shot up and taken to jail. I went to jail and there was a law that if you go to jail and you have a doctor, your doctor can come and visit you. So I went to the jail and I said, I'm here to see my patients. Oh, they said, oh no, you're not getting in here. And I said, yes I am. And the ACLU was there and a bunch of other lawyers. And I got in to see them. I came out and I talked about the awful conditions. And that, that had its press and, and it was an event. A couple of years later, the ACLU sues the jail over horrid conditions and they asked me to be an expert. I said, I'm not an expert. I don't know anything about jails and I've never testified in court. They said, that's all right. Nobody else has either. This is a, a new case and uh, we just want you to go back and do what you did for the Panthers. So I did. I was uh, really shocked. I was shocked when I saw what they were doing the Panthers, but I thought they're punishing them. You know, the Panthers are standing off with the cops and there's a lot of animosity, so it makes sense that they were brutalizing them. I go in and see that they're brutalizing everybody else. The um, dormitories are just massively overcrowded, so that people are sleeping on the table they're supposed to be eating meals on. In the uh, double bunk cells, there's three or four people and the tougher one is sleeping on the top bunk, the second is in the second, it's lower bunk, and the two who aren't as tough are sleeping on the floor. 
and there's no activities, and I have never seen as much untreated, severe, acute mental illness in my life. I read about it in the asylums, but it was before my time, and the asylums were present in the LA County Jail. So I testified about that case, and then I kept doing other cases. I'm telling you about my experience because I can see you're shocked, and um, I, I don't want to make people walk away and want to keep this furthest from their mind because it's so horrifying. I, we have to do something about that, and that's my purpose for exposing what's going on. The next thing that shocked me is that the criminal justice system is not just. I mean, I, I had a liberal education, and you know, I read, and I, I had a certain idea about the way courts work and that kind of thing. Um, but I have never seen the degree of injustice that I started seeing when I started going into the jails and prisons. Robert King's story is an example. Robert King is one of the Angola three. These are three black men who were kept in solitary confinement at Angola State Prison in Louisiana for over 30 years. And Robert King was the first one to, to get out. And he wrote a book. His book is From the Bottom of the Heap, and I recommend it. Um, in it, he tells how he went to jail. He didn't do anything. He grew up in a tough neighborhood. There was a lot of crime, there was a lot of violence, but he hadn't done anything. And the name of the book is From the Bottom of the Heap, and it's Robert King is the author. It's his autobiography. Uh, in the autobiography, he tells the story that he was uh, put in a lineup. They just grabbed kids off the street, put them in a lineup. And so they had a bunch of black people in a lineup. And someone who was the victim of a crime identified him. No, actually, no, it wasn't the uh, victim. It was the perpetrator of a crime. They asked the perpetrator, who was your partner? And he identified Robert. So he got convicted, and he was being sent to prison. He was still in the jail in Louisiana where they were being tried. And Robert King comes up for a trial because he's now been fingered, and he's standing trial for the same crime, which was armed robbery or something. And um, they come to the guy they just convicted, and they say, OK, now we need you to go to court to identify Robert King. And he said, I've never seen a man in my life. I don't know Robert King. He wasn't with me when I did the crime. And so the defender said, would you come into court and say that? And he said, sure. And he came into court and he said exactly that. The only reason I identified Robert King is I had to identify someone so I get a lesser sentence. And so I identified him because I didn't know him and I, I didn't think he would be able to do me any harm. So Robert King's sitting in the courtroom and he writes about this and he says, so I'm thinking, okay, now they're going to uh, let me go. They're going to acquit me. No, they convicted him. And he went to prison. And he got, you know, 10 years or something like that. But in the prison, a guard was murdered. And they blamed the three, the Angola three, who had nothing to do with it. Everybody knew who murdered the guard. But these were three people who were the most sophisticated politically in the prison. So he spent all that time in solitary. 50% of prisoners are black. There's only 13% African Americans in our country. What are 50% of prisoners? How, how did that happen? It has to be very, very pervasive uh, racism. And the prisons actually give us a, just a, a picture of the racism of our society. I think there's a legitimation crisis. This is a word of Jer Jürgen Habermas, the German philosopher. And Habermas uh, is, is a sort of neo-Marxist, and he says, you know, it isn't just the power of the state. It isn't the police, and it isn't the political bodies and the infrastructure that keeps us all in line. It's also a belief system that we believe that what's going on is what should be going on. And if there's a contradiction between what we think we know is going on and what we find out is going on, we have a legitimation crisis and it sets us up to protest about what's going on. That's a legitimation crisis. Well, I think the fact that 50% of prisoners are black establishes a uh, legitimation crisis. I think what happened to Robert King 
anybody who thinks about it at all says, wait a second, there's no justice in the legal system. What's wrong here? I have a set of beliefs that we live in a just democratic society. We have a saying, lock them up and throw away the key. I believe that the saying is the solution to our legitimation crisis. That is, if we get the people who go to prison out of the community, far away, it's secret, as I said. We don't know what's going on in there. We don't know what happens to them. And if we adopt the attitude that these are horrible people and they deserve horrible punishment, then we can rest a little more easily that we live in a democracy and there's justice. Well, that's wrong at every point. First of all, the people that go to prison, as I've said, are not heinous criminals. Some are. Some heinous criminals don't go to prison. But they're not all heinous criminals. They are treated terribly. So what are we going to do with that? So one thing we do is we say, lock them up and throw away the key. Heinous criminals deserve whatever punishment they get. And then we go on with our comfortable lives. Well, we, do, we disappear more than just the prisoners. We also live in a society where I think the average belief is that if you suffer from serious mental illness in this country, you will get treatment. That's what we believe. Now, a lot of us believe that they have better treatment in the jails and prisons than out here in the community. But we think that people with serious mental illness will get treatment, adequate treatment. It's not true. It's not true out here in the community, and, it's not, and, and, and that's why so many people with mental illness go to jail and prison. And it's not true in the jails and prison. I believe that what we've done is disappeared a social problem that we as a society have no will to deal with. That is treatment for public mental health. You know, we have a history in this country with deinstitutionalization, community mental health. That history is continuous, incremental defunding of mental health care for poor people. And it's going into overdrive right now. Um, so we have defunded public mental health. We generally, I think, ascribe to the notion that people with serious mental illness should have treatment. There is no treatment. What are we going to do about that? Get them out of here, they go to prison, and then we don't have to think about them. Same is true of substance abuse. Same is true of a lot of other problems. Developmental disabilities, illiteracy, very high degree of illiteracy in prison. Instead of saying there's something wrong here that our education system is failing, we say these are dumb people, they should go to prison. So it's out of sight and out of mind, and we disappear the problems we don't have the will to deal with. I want to share some statistics. Criminology is all about statistics. The United States has 5% of the world's population and 50% of the world's prisoners. Um, we have more people in solitary confinement by far than any other country in the world. We have 100,000 people in solitary confinement. The prison population has multiplied seven times since the 1970s. The war on drugs has been a main driver of that uh, geometric expansion. But there have been other causes, for instance, lengthening sentences, three strikes, all that kind of thing. Um, so we have almost two and a half million prisoners in this country, and that's not counting immigrants. I have no idea how many immigrants we have locked up, but President Trump is advertising two or three million. Um, so we just are the, we incarcerate just far more people than any other country in the world. In the years, in the decades where the prison population has multiplied seven times, the proportion with serious mental illness has risen. So we have just been systematically disappearing people with mental illness into the prisons. Now some people argue that that makes sense because look at the crime rates. Well, actually, if you look carefully at the crime rates, and the Sentencing Project in Washington, D.C. does this for us, um, crime rates haven't changed. If you follow crime rates, they go up or down by two points here or there. There are seven times as many prisoners today as in the 70s. So the two or three percent up and down of the crime rate does not explain the seven time multiplication of the prison population. You also, if you compare the different states and compare the crime rates with the incarceration rates, it will not support the idea 
that putting people in uh, prison reduces crime rates. In the 1980s, we had a big problem in this country. And the problem was that the prisons, because of crowding, and I was testifying about that, crowding causes an increase in violence, mental illness, suicide, etc. And um, the prisons were out of control. What the public thought about was riots. There were riots in New Mexico, in New York, all over the place. Um, they were out of control. So criminologists mostly, and I among them, said, well, the problem is you've got crowding and you can't control your prisons. Also, you've been downsizing rehabilitation. You should uh, put it back together and uh, let a lot of people out of prison, like low-level drug offenders, and give the rest of them rehabilitation, and your violence rate would go way down. We have a lot of evidence that that's true. The powers that be said, no, we're not going to do that. We think there are bad apples among the prisoners, and we're going to lock them up. They're already in prison. We're going to put them in a solitary confinement cell and leave them there for decades. And, and that's what they did. So I call that a historic wrong turn. In prison, prisoners of color and prisoners with mental illness are disproportionately sent to solitary confinement. And I should add, people who are politically sophisticated are also sent to solitary confinement. I think something that goes on is that officers in general, they're paid a lot. They're paid two or three times what school teachers make in California. In other states, they're not. But, and they're not real bright. They, they, there's a lower level to apply for correction officer than police, for instance. They're threatened by very intelligent prisoners. And they throw them in the hole. So there's a lot, your most political prisoners are going to serve much of their time in solitary confinement. Um, the damage, let me quickly mention, I happen to be an expert on what the damage is, but I don't think this audience needs to know a lot about that. There are a number of symptoms that are just so pervasive that it's obvious solitary confinement causes them. One is very high anxiety. Another is uh, what I mentioned about problems concentrating in memory. Another is despair. The suicide rate in solitary confinement is extremely high. 50% of all successful suicides in prison, and there's a lot more suicides in prison than out here in the community, 50% occur in solitary confinement. Um, there is pacing in the cell. There is uh, anger, mounting anger. And the prisoners all tell me they're afraid the anger will get them in trouble with the officers and they'll get into more, more trouble. So um, they have a number of, uh, of problems. One is thinking itself. Paranoia is very problematic. And, and that makes sense if you think about it. I think all of us get a little bit paranoid all the time. That is, uh, I call someone, leave a message, and two or three weeks go by and they don't call me back. And I think, they don't like me. Or I said something wrong the last time I was with them. And then eventually I see them and they say, well, I was sick and I wasn't answering messages. And I think to myself, I don't say anything, but I think I was being paranoid. Or I walk into a room and two people are talking in the far corner and I think they're talking about me. They're saying some nasty stuff. I walk over to them and they say, hi, Terry. And I say, oh, they're not hostile. So I was being paranoid. And we think that way. We have little moments of secret paranoia, and we resolve that. It's called reality testing. Well, if you're in a cell by yourself, and some officers down the hall are laughing and swearing, and you get the idea, just as random, because your mind is working, and you don't know what to pin your ideas to, they're, they're, they're talking about me. They're going to come in here and beat me up, or rape me, or do whatever. And you have no place to put that idea. You have no human being to talk to. You can't check it out with the officers. And then if one of them walks by and cusses at you, you say, oh, I was right. They're going to hurt me. They're going to do something. And then prisoners often react in very self-destructive ways to that paranoid idea. But it's not surprising that they're paranoid. Then there are longer term. There was a case in California, the Ashker case, which we settled a couple years ago. And the, my job then, and Craig Haney, who does this work with me, um, was to find out 
What happens, all of the symptoms I've told you so far happen when you're in SHU for a very short time. It can be a month, it can be a year. But when we first went to Pelican Bay, a very famous lawsuit, Madrid versus Gomez in the early 90s, Pelican Bay was only open for a few years. So we told the court all those symptoms. Now in the Ashker case, it's being relitigated on slightly different lines. And our job is, well, what happens? There's a bunch of people that stayed there now for 20 years. What additional damage is there if you're in the shoe for decades rather than months or years? And we found it. And they fit into two main categories. One is isolation. People in shoe for a decade or longer, and that was the class in the Asher lawsuit, isolate themselves far beyond the requirements of their isolated confinement. I mean, they're in a cell. In Pelican Bay, the, the, the door is not solid metal. It's a metal grid with little pinholes in it. So you can look out at, particularly if you walk up close to it, you can look out and you see a distorted picture. But you're facing a blank wall, and it's rare that anybody walks past. But in the neighboring cells next to you, you can yell out. And it's illegal. You get a ticket for yelling out, but they do it, and sometimes the officers don't give them tickets. You can yell out, and you can say hi, and you know who's in the neighboring cells, and how are you, and you know what's happening with your mother, or something like that. As time goes on, prisoners stop doing that. They stop talking to anybody, including the prisoner in the next cell. They don't talk to the officer, and that's fine because the officer doesn't want to talk to them who brings their food tray. And they become more and more isolated, even more extremely than their situation requires. The other thing they become is numb. They call it being a zombie or being dead. And it comes from what I said about anger. The anger mounts. That seems to be a symptom of human beings in solitary confinement. It happens to everybody. They all report it. And they're always afraid the anger is going to get them in more trouble and they're going to have a longer shoe term. So they suppress it. And what all of the prisoners I talked to at Pelican Bay, and those, this, for this lawsuit it was 25, told me is that that makes them numb. That they work so hard at suppressing their anger that they start losing touch with all other feelings. They have no one to talk to about feelings, and that's part of how we experience feelings, is we socially engage other people with our feelings. And when they can't do that, they lose contact with their feelings. And then when they get out, they aren't able to talk to the people they love. So wives, in particular, of men who've been in solitary confinement tell me, what am I supposed to do with him? He won't talk to me. He doesn't tell me what's going on. He sits in his room, and he stews. And that's a typical picture. There are many people who get out and they function extremely well, but they're doing it against all odds. They're just amazingly resilient people. Um, let's talk about remedies. When I testify in court, I'm asked, what's the remedy? I, I think we have to end solitary confinement. I don't think that it's a human, it's, it's not something human beings should be in. It's not something human beings should do to other human beings. It's very practical. There's no evidence that solitary confinement does anything to help with the security issues in a prison. Um, it does cause immense damage, and I've described it. I haven't even gotten into mental illness. What it does with people, who, all, everyone, all the symptoms I've talked about happen in people who are relatively stable. For people who have a mental illness, it exacerbates their mental illness and it makes it much worse than before. Um, so we should get rid of solitary confinement. A lot of wardens and commissioners and state governors agree with me about that. President Obama agreed. Supreme Court Justice Kennedy agreed. And I'm asked, so what are we supposed to do with people we can't control? And I have some solutions. One of the solutions, for instance, well, you have to staff them. If someone is out of control in prison, first of all, they're acting self-destructively. There's a psychiatric problem just on the face of it. What you need is some staff time to figure out, basically a case conference, what should we do with this guy? What is making him so angry and what difficult to control? And so you have to work out both a management plan and a treatment plan. The way to do that in prison with the people who have spent time in solitary and they've suffered pretty severe damage 
is to set up what I call residential treatment facilities, step-down units. They're also called intermediate treatment. They're like a halfway house in the community. They're a cell block, or a part of a cell block, can even be a pod, where there's extra mental health staff. Not hospital level, that would be very expensive. A psychologist, a social worker, who go around and seriously talk to everybody every day and say, how's it going? How are you doing out on the yard? You got any enemies? Do we need to talk about anything? And if you do that, if you give people that kind of human contact, they don't get into trouble. So you have guys, for instance, with mental illness who get victimized out on the yard. They'll tell the psychologist on their uh, unit, if there is one, and that's what I'm proposing is that we have them there, and they'll say, I can't handle the yard. I want to stay in my cell during recreation time. And the psychologist will say, what's the problem? There are some people that keep taking all of my things or threatening to rape me. And the psychologist can then strategize something. Well, let's put you on a different yard. Let's do something. Let's put you next to the staff person, whatever. You can figure out a plan, and then the prisoner gets the message, well, I've got a human being to talk to who's interested in me and, and, and will help me. That's a specific detail that I give commissioners when they say, what should we do? And residential treatment programs work. The state of Colorado has ended solitary confinement a few months ago. Uh, uh, Rick Ramish, the uh, commissioner, wrote an op-ed in the New York Times about it. And, and that's a model. It's, it's, it's not hard to attain. They've had no further violence in Colorado. In fact, it's been more peaceful because they don't have so many people locked up in solitary. So it's, it, it, it's a, uh, it can be accomplished. Speaking in more general terms, the criminal justice seat, uh, system needs to be drastically reformed. First of all is sentencing reform, which is the um, the background to all of the problems we have in our jails and prisons, and also, for instance, um, uh, killing of young black men, um, which we have a national epidemic about. Um, we need to send fewer people to jail and prison, far fewer, for far shorter times. I'll give you an example of the irrationality of our uh, sentencing system. Here is research, clinical research, about substance abuse. If you send someone with a substance abuse problem to jail or prison, they will come out of jail or prison with a substance abuse problem. It's a flat, flat curve. If you register them in a community recovery program, a bona fide program that has some kind of accreditation, uh, and they, they complete the program, they, there's an 80% likelihood that they will be clean and sober after three years. There's the research. So jail and prison are the wrong place for people with substance abuse problems. Now, we have an epidemic in California in particular, but a lot of other states, of violating people's parole because they have a dirty urine. It makes absolutely no sense. What we're doing is we're sending them to the place which makes substance abuse worse and we're doing it because they're abusing substances. It's just screwy. And that's the way all of our sentencing rules are, including three strikes. I mean, as people get older, they tend to get more peaceful, and they get more productive, and they think about their problems. But we lock them up forever because they did a crime when they were a teenager, and now they've done another crime. It makes no sense. We have to totally reverse that then we have to deal with the causes of people going to prison. We have to change the sentencing. We have to increase rehabilitation in the prisons. And then we have to look at why people are going to prison. Well, I believe that for the, I'd say 50% of prisoners who have very serious mental health problems, the two reasons that they've gone to prison, besides their poverty they grew up in, the multiple traumas they've experienced, have been inadequate public mental health uh, services out in the community for their mental difficulties, and housing. They have no place to live. They've fallen, most of them, into homelessness. And this society, as we've done with all the other social safety net issues, is we've reneged on our social contract. Instead of the government looking out for the people who are most disadvantaged, we actually criminalize homelessness. 
And for various reasons, we put people who are homeless in jail. So we have to look at the things out in the community. Now, to help that, there are more technical things that can happen. One is called diversion, which we have in the Bay Area. We're a leader in the country in diversion, particularly San Francisco. And that is when someone is in front of a judge for usually relatively minor offenses and could go to prison, we offer them, you know, if you would get yourself into a really effective mental health program and stop doing drugs, go into recovery, I wouldn't send you to prison. And that's called diversion. And behavioral health courts do that. That's one little step on the way of what I'm talking about. But the, the, the end goal has to be that we have to massively uh, reduce the jail and prison population. And we have to treat the people who happen to be there. And as I say, they're a very ordinary population. We have to treat them as human beings. I will stop with that. Were you an expert witness in the Towson case? I believe the case is still. Were you an expert witness in the Towson case? What? Too saint. No one can hear you. Too saint. Nobody can hear me. Okay. Come, come. Okay, this is now. Now can you hear me? Yeah. Were you an expert witness in the Towson case? I believe the case is still monitored. But what kind of effect did Judge Henderson's ruling have? Um, the Toussaint case was in the late 70s and early 80s. I was a witness in that case. It was about putting, I just described the awful solitary confinement cells. The Toussaint case was about putting two people in each of those cells. It was about double selling in the shoes of California. It wasn't Judge Henderson, it was Judge Weigel. And um, we got a very good ruling, and the state of California had to stop putting people involuntarily double cell in a single cell, solitary cell. So it's still possible, like at Pelican Bay, some people are double celled, but they have to agree to it. And that was the result of the Toussaint case. It's T-O-U-S-S-A-I-N-T, which is the name of the prisoner who was the first plaintiff. Durbin Bill. You need to use this too. No, we can hear you. It's okay. We're good. She doesn't need that. Well, this does not get to you. This is going to the camera. Does the Durbin Bill to end or reduce federal solitary use a standard chance? Use a standard chance. That question raises very depressing ramifications of our political situation. When Obama was president, we had Obama saying, solitary confinement is terrible, we shouldn't use it in the federal system. We're sentencing too many people to prison, particularly African American people, young males in particular. We should not be making contracts with private contractors to run prisons. He was doing all of these things. Trump's first statement about criminal justice is, I don't see anything wrong with waterboarding. <laughs> and it's been downhill ever since. The uh, stock in private prison com uh, companies went sky high the day Trump won the election. The immigration, ICE is above the law. I don't know how much you know about it. It's, it's a current priority for me. I think it's one of the greatest injustices. It makes everything I've said today look like kindergarten. What ICE does is incredible, and nobody has oversight over ICE. There are no investigations. The ICE detention facilities are mostly private prisons. They use solitary confinement 
more than any of our state and federal prisons. Sexual abuse is rampant in the ICE facilities. And um, all of this is under Trump's administrative orders. So we're in big trouble about that. Um, I think private prisons are a problem because, a huge problem, because how do you make money in prison? You cut your staff. Staff is what you pay money for in prison, the operating budget. And if you cut your staff, what are you going to have? More violence. You're going to send more people to solitary. The staff are going to be less uh, well selected, less well trained, and less well supervised. Sexual abuse is going to go sky high. In fact, that's what we have. Tell us about the shoe hunger strike. All right. Um, many of you know about this, I think, because in 2011 and 2012, there were three hunger strikes. They were initiated by a group of, of prisoners at Pelican Bay Shoe. And I've been talking about shoes. Pelican Bay is one of the worst in the country. And not because of the physical decay of the facility, but because of the absolute military uh, denial of all human amenities in, in the shoe. So these prisoners had exhausted all of their complaint mechanisms. They had written complaints. They had talked to senators. Senators and representatives had gone up to see them. The state was doing nothing. And they were in there for 20, 30, 40 years. So they went on a hunger strike, for which they were severely punished. 6,000 prisoners joined them immediately around the state of California in their hunger strike. And that was the reason. Their demands were extremely simple. They wanted a few more amenities in solitary confinement. They wanted to have actual due process. Once you were alleged to be related to a gang, you would never get out of the shoe. And there was no way for you to prove that you weren't, in fact, connected with the gang. And they asked that there be some kind of honorable due process so that they could defend themselves and show why it's wrong that they're being alleged to be gang members. The state would not give them that, but they went on a hunger strike with that kind of a demand. And the hunger strike was a massive PR success, but the state did nothing. And because of that, the um, Center for Constitutional Rights stepped in and said, we're going to sue over the very demands the prisoners are making. And that became the Asher case, and I testified. I was first on the mediation team between the hunger strikers and the State Department of Corrections. Then when the lawsuit happened, they asked me to be a witness, so I had to step down from the mediation team. And we had a very big victory in that lawsuit. It was by settlement. And I think because the state had painted themselves in a corner, they had too much solitary confinement. They couldn't support it. And they had to back down. So the Asker case gave them an excuse. Um, Dr. Corey Weinstein is one of the um, pioneers. He's in the audience. That's why I mentioned him, of exposing the horrors of solitary confinement. And uh, Todd Asker, who is the named plaintiff in the Asker case, was a patient of Dr. Weinstein's. Megan, Megan writes, hi, Dr. K. Which agency or group do you think is especially effective at making improvements in prison? That's a very good uh, question. Thank you, Megan. Um, I want to make some uh, recommendations about organizations. There are many. As I said, people who have seen this become committed to reforming the prisons and doing something about the horrors that they see. So I want to mention a few groups that are particularly, not just that they're especially doing the best work. I think, you know, the law, oh, that's down for the, the law groups, the Center for Constitutional Rights, the ACLU in California, the Prison Law Office, the uh, Southern Poverty Law Center, I work with all of them. Uh, they're doing phenomenal work and they're working night and day. But these are groups that you could join. So I'm going to mention a few. One is the California Coalition for Women Prisoners. And you can look it up on the web. California Coalition for Women Prisoners. They do a lot of good work. They're currently involved. They've been involved for years in fighting against sexual abuse and giving women some kind of protection in prison. So that be going to prison doesn't mean you're going to be raped and can't do anything about it. Uh, they're currently working on ending life without parole. 
we have many thousands of people in California prisons who are never going to get out because they have a sentence of life without parole, which again has absolutely no purpose. Yes? California Coalition for, I missed the word before prisoners. For women. Women. Women, women prisoners. California Coalition for Women Prisoners. Thank you. The Ella Baker Center has been stellar and they are doing a lot of really great programs. They work both with teens at risk of going in the criminal justice system, people who are in the criminal justice system, and people who get out of jail and prison and need services to help them. A couple of their programs, three of their programs, uh, Jobs Not Jails, is a program for juveniles to find work and train people to do work. Um, Restore Oakland, um, is a very important project that's really now getting off the ground and they're going to work with people who get out of prison. And Books Not Bars, again, is a uh, program for juveniles. So that's all the Ella Baker Center. You can look them up on the web. And the last one I want to mention is Legal Services for Prisoners with Children. They don't do so much representation, although their lawyers were my lawyers in the, in the Ashker case. They joined the Center for Constitutional Rights in, uh, pressing that case. But they do mostly services for prisoners and their families, and they're terrific at it. And if you want to volunteer, if you want to give money, if you want to see what's going on, look them up and go to their events. Does Prop 47 offer any good solutions for bringing prisoners home to meet their communities? Remind me what Prop 47 is. I forget the numbers. Which one was Prop 47? Maybe it's 57. Um, Who asked this question? 47 is, is decriminalization of misdemeanors uh, and infractions and people who are imprisoned or relatively minor. I, I, I don't have an actual outcome, but I think that the initiatives that aim at reducing sentences, and particularly reducing automatic sentences, so there's a lot of crimes that you get automatic life without parole or automatic 30 years or something. And that's been a very bad development, and initiatives are reversing that, and I think it's one of them. And that's very important. I just got a political question for you. Do you know of any um, of those running for Thurman's District 15 position who are anti-solitary confinement and will work to end it? <laughs> okay, I, I was going to have to say I didn't know, so thank you for that. By the way, someone mentioned Durbin's committee. Durbin's committee uh, did work on a, a solitary confinement. Durbin is the uh, senior senator from Illinois, and I testified in front of that committee. They never got anywhere with the Senate. So um, there's still the potential. There are people like Durbin who would like to see something happen where we ban solitary, but they're not you know, we're losing pretty badly in Congress right now, and solitary confinement is just part of the loss. We're just not getting any good legislation. What do you think of the Netflix show Orange is the New Black? <laughs> <laughs> has um, research, wait a minute, has research been done on the psychological profile of prison guards? Oh, wait a minute, somebody asked three questions in one. You only get one, try the orange black one. All right. Um, let me say, follow up to Durbin, that the state legislatures, many of them have passed laws. For instance, Maine started, Illinois has one, New York has one, Colorado has one, barring the placement of people with mental illness in solitary. So there's a lot of activity going on in the, in the, in the states. Um, orange is the New Black, I think, is a wonderful drama. It's not at all accurate. It, it doesn't show you what's going on in jail. Um, but it's wonderful to focus some attention on the fact that these are human beings and they have drama going on. And uh, things in women's prisons are very different. Things with women in solitary confinement, as you can imagine, I'll say this, and I don't want to get into any political trouble with this group, but men are different than women. <laughs> women are more centrally focused on intimate relationships and sharing what's going on on a feeling level than men. I admit that. I think it's a fault of, of masculinity and we're working to change it and I think a lot of the men here are working with me to change that. But women much more honor 
personal intimacy and connection with others, and it's much more a central part of their life. You put them in solitary confinement, and they fall apart just like the men, but differently, depression is much more common. And what happens is that they miss social connection in a different way than men. And that doesn't keep the state from putting them in solitary. Okay, this person who asked more than one question had a really good one. Mm -hmm. Has research been done on the psychological profile of prison guards? Yes, quite a lot. Um, actually, well, no, that's not about that. Prison guards live in the same situation as the prisoners. If you think about it, solitary confinement. The guard is in solitary confinement too. He's got the other guards who he can talk to. By the way, guards like to be called officers. Prisoners like to be called prisoners. They don't like inmate. Guards like to be called officers. They don't like guards. So generally, I try to call them officers, and I call prisoners prisoners. Um, they are subject to the same environmental factors as the prisoners. So I mentioned that crowding causes an increase in violence, mental breakdown, and suicide. Well, guess what? Officers, as a profession, have high incidences of domestic violence, substance abuse, and suicide relative to other professions. So yes, it's been studied and uh, officers have a rather hard time. Uh, now often, the most abusive officers are the most disturbed. And what happens in prison is, I don't believe that all officers are bad. I think a lot of people go into police work for good reasons and they want to help people. However, in a situation like solitary confinement, the bad officers rise to the top. They abuse prisoners, they're just into it. They're more sadistic than everybody else. And the other officers do nothing to stop them because of what's called the blue code. You do not inform on officers. Officers don't inform on officers. So there's a no snitch rule among prisoners. You don't snitch out other prisoners. And there's just as strong or stronger don't cross the line and testify against another officer. Now, there have been cases where they broke that rule, but that rule is extremely strong. So what I find, for instance, I, I did a case, this is not about solitary, but about prison rape. Uh, in Michigan, we had a case, a class action about prison rape, and this woman got on the stand and she told her story. And it's extremely brave. It takes a lot of courage to get on the stand and tell your story because you're going right back to the prison with the same men who abused you are in charge of you again. And she said that an officer took her out of her living environment across a line in the hall that prisoners are not supposed to cross, even with an officer. Took her by his sergeant who was sitting at a desk, stopped and chatted with the sergeant while she was standing there not knowing what was going on or what was gonna happen and then marched her down the hall, took her into a closet, and raped her viciously. Then he left her there. And she got herself together, put her clothes on, and walked back down the hall. And that sergeant sitting there, who had been chatting with the other officer who raped her, said, what are you doing here? Don't you know uh, prisoners aren't supposed to be in this hall? There's the blue coat. I always find in rape situations that other officers knew what was going on. It's extremely hard to get them to say anything. You didn't mention bail reform. How can we keep those not convicted of a crime out of jail because they can't make bail? Absolutely critical. I didn't mention a whole lot of issues. I didn't mention the death penalty. Um, Bail reform is absolutely critical. I'm in a case right now about competence to stand trial. It's a statewide case in California. And I've been in cases, similar cases, in Washington and Utah, which we won. What happens is if someone is arrested and they're very disturbed, they will be declared incompetent when they get to court. Either their lawyer or the judge will say, you can't be on trial, you're not coherent and you can't participate in your own defense, you're incompetent. They will then have to wait six months in jail before being mandatory transferred to a state hospital for what's called competency restoration treatment. 
So now they're doing a six month jail sentence without ever being convicted of anything. The only reason they're doing that sentence is they can't afford bail. So they have an emotional problem. They're not competent to stand trial. More affluent people who are not competent to stand trial go home and they go into psychiatric treatment or they get the competency restoration somewhere else. Um, but if you're poor, you stay in jail. Bail reform is absolutely critical. The other thing that's critical, and that, and that is, you know, bail is, it should be a way to keep dangerous people off the street. That is the reason why someone should have a high bail is because they're dangerous and they're an escape risk. The people in jail, the poor people in jail, are neither dangerous nor an escape risk. They just can't afford the bail. So all of the reforms in bail are to make bail a rational system. That is, the judge has to decide how dangerous is this person and how likely an escape risk. If they're not dangerous or an escape risk, let them go and give them a date to come back to court. And that's what affluent people do. Uh, the other thing is the uh, charging and pleading business. Many, many, many prisoners tell me they didn't do the crime they were convicted of. <coughs> Why is that? I, I told you the story of Robert King, and his is just one of millions of stories like that. In pleading, if they arrest you, say you're black and young, and you're on the street, the wrong street, and they arrest you, and they say, we think you're part of this burglary that happened. You say, no, I'm not, and I have an alibi, here's where I was, and all that kind of stuff. They say, look, you can go to court and try to prove that to the jury. And if you fail to prove that to the jury, you're going to get 50 years. If you would plead guilty to a minor this or that, we'll give you three years and let you out of here. An awful lot of people do that. I don't know if it's the majority, but an awful lot of people do that. And they, what happens is the court then does not have to be so crowded because they've uh, adjudicated someone. They've settled the case. This person says he didn't do it, but he's going to plead guilty in order to get a shorter sentence because he's terrified of the long sentence. And I told you Robert King's story. He doesn't have to have done the crime, particularly if he's black or Latino. So he's going to plead to something lesser. Then he's going to prison for a shorter time without ever having done anything. So then I go into prison and a whole bunch of people tell me, I didn't do anything. And we all think, oh yeah, sure, all prisoners say they didn't do anything. Um, we have in our Lexington Commons a little bit of a little bit of a little bit of a little bit of a oftentimes are the ones who decide whether somebody's going to have bail or not. And the ACLU is, um, got the, on their website, uh, is putting down information that people should know before they vote on uh, Alameda County's district attorney. I think that Contra Costa may have an election also, but definitely um, uh, Alameda County does. And as I said, ACLU, uh, on their website has information about the people running for uh, district attorney in Alameda County. I'm going to also say, make an announcement. Tomorrow, legal services, you want for, to pris stand? Yeah. Legal services for prisoners with children is uh, sponsoring a quest for Democracy Day in Sacramento in which um, Sir showing up for racial justice is going to lobby with them on a number of important bills. Uh, one of them, a number of them having to do with sentence enhancements so that, you know, if people on top of the current, whatever the current charge is, if they've had a former felony, they're, they're getting sentence enhancements. Great. This is a very good discussion. Yes, DAs are very important. I don't know if you remember, but um, when they did realignment, which was the state was on Supreme Court order, to reduce the prison population. And what Jerry Brown decided to do was to send a bunch of state prisoners to the counties to be finish their time in the counties. And then various people reacted to that. Gascon in San Francisco said, this is great. We're going to take these guys. We're going to assess them. We're going to see how dangerous they are. And we're going to get them out of jail and put them in the community on probation. And we're going to give them programs. The DA of Los Angeles said, well, look, 
The state is saying that they'll only take the most severe, the most serious criminals in the state prison system. We're going to overcharge everybody. He didn't say overcharge, I'm saying overcharge. We're going to charge them with the maximum possible charges so that they will not be eligible for realignment to the counties. Those are two different attitudes on the part of a DA. We've just, in this electoral, uh, hopefully a sweep that's going to happen in, 19, in 2018, uh, we've just won the election of a DA in Philadelphia who is a progressive and is not bringing minor drug charges. He's not bringing marijuana charges. He's not charging the death penalty. And he's trying to do something about all the people who pled unfairly under duress because they were threatened with long prison terms. So they pled to something they haven't done. He's going to try to go into the system and find those people and resentence them. So it's possible to win on this issue. Was there a question back there? Terry? No, I was going to make a statement there. Also, now that you've kind of had several times. Wait a minute, let me give you this. Just send that back. I had several poor clients who were offered the same thing. Either you take a, a three year plea or you take 30 years. And they refused either one. They landed in jail for two or three years. They made them so frustrated they had to take their two or three years because they already served two years waiting on trial. Then they finally gave in and gave in. They took the three year deal. They ended up on five years total. That happens quite often before the young men go out of prison. I also have a lot of men, I have several bipolar clients who were in jail for misdemeanors. They gave them three years, he's been three years. When you call them, they're trying to get mental health services, and they could have been up going to a stand quick for three years when they were bipolar or had other mental health issues. This is all very important. And you know, the real crime that people go to jail and prison for is for being black and being poor, or being Latino and being poor. I mean, that's the main thing, that's the main reason that people are in jail and prison. And, and the plea bargaining is just one little, bail is another. People spend years in jail because they can't afford bail before they're adjudicated. So, wait, 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 John, yeah. where's John? You're I'm here. Okay. Are you, uh, Oh, okay. Have we got a microphone? Yes. I'm, I'm happy yeah, to take it. <coughs> Good. <laughs> so there is a district attorney project nationally that's taking place to remove district attorneys in this coming election across the United States, including LA and Dr. Cosmopan. Sean King, S-H-A-U-N. King is the spokesperson for that national effort. In fact, he spoke yesterday in Oakland. So I encourage you to look up on the web and follow what he's up to because we do have a very progressive woman running an Alameda County panel for us for against the incumbent who's taking tens of thousands of dollars for various police shootings as most of them. Thank you for that. You'll have to ask the people who are supporting our party. I don't know specific I know specifics about Alameda County, but that's not a I want to thank you all so much for being here. This has been wonderful, Terry. Thank you. For me too. Thank you.